and we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to yet another cracking edition of the Matt Brown Show. Today I am joined all the way from the bright lights of Uganda in East Africa, uh, from the penthouse, a sharp Farida. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with everyone and to share my story. Thank you so much. No, really, the privilege is all mine. So, um, so you have just done some of the most incredible work. Uh, you have your own foundation, and we're going to get into that. Um, and you really are making a difference, not only in Uganda, but seemingly now all around the world. Um, you have been featured in a global campaign, you're a UN woman, as part of the UN's Women Impossible to Ignore a campaign, and that uh, really did go global. Um, and so, um, this is going to be lots to talk about here, guys. Um, but this is such an inspirational story. But, um, but, but, Ashaba, why don't you take us back to like the beginning? Like, where did the spark come from to make such an inspirational difference to humanity for you? Thank you so much, Matt, for asking. Um, well, the story, if we were to start from the very beginning and to keep it very short, um, well, um, I didn't grow up in, uh, I grew up in a humble background and I grew up with a single mother and I saw how she was struggling to make ends meet for me and my sibling and uh, for everyone else she was, you know, helping at home. And uh, I also saw her helping so many people. So I believe in a way it sparked something within me to want to do uh a difference or to want to help others because I saw it from my mother and you know what they say we learn uh, everything from those who raise us so with time as I went on it became so natural to me that whenever I would go to school even if I didn't have money whenever I would see people by the streets I would want to help them the money I would, I'd want to give them the money I had mm-hmm. because it touched me in a way I felt like I could make a difference and fast forward in, I think, secondary school, I, I don't know whether that's college or high school to your side, but um, it, it, the passion grew stronger within me. I really wanted to make a difference, but I didn't know how to start. And I also realized that most people would never believe, um, you know, someone so young could do so much. So I didn't try as I thought I would because people didn't trust in me then, even if I really wanted to help. So immediately after high school, I realized that I'm not going to wait forever to be able to help other people. So what I did is that I would always reach out to those people who had more and take it to those who didn't have. So I'd always go to people who had like excess clothes, you no longer wearing them, you have excess books, you have excess shoes, anything that you're no longer using. And mm. I'll get it and I'll take it to different orphanages in the area where I was. And I, would, I did this for about like um, six months. And then I would always supplement it with the pocket money that I had and buy simple things like toilet paper, liquid soap and all this. It went on for some time, maybe like a year or two because I did not have the resources. But with time, I say getting people who were really interested in changing you know, their communities and their societies one step at a time and they joined me as volunteers and I would go with them here and there, a few places. But then along the way, when I did uh, start my training to become a pilot, I realized that I could add something, you know, because uh, during my studies, I noticed there were not so many women, you know, in class. Like you could find out of 20 boys, there would only be two women in that exact class, which was a bit unfair. So I asked myself, why aren't girls doing this? And then I realized so many girls drop out of school before they have a chance to follow their dreams. So I decided to add promoting girl child education and empowerment to one of our missions because I thought uh, I could use my profession to actually speak to these girls and tell them, there is no profession that you can do if you put your mind onto it. Mm. And so that is what we have been doing up until now, trying to, you know, change our communities or societies one step at a time. And what I've been trying to tell my volunteers all this while is that you can no longer rely or you cannot say the government should do this and this and this. I mean, they have their things they should do, but you as a person, what are you doing? And that's what I've been telling them. Even if you give one thing, it can, you know, someone can pay it forward. If you help someone, they'll help someone, they'll help the other person. So what are you doing as yourself before talking and giving opinions? Take your own action. And that is what it, it has been now. I think it's about five years. And that is what we have been doing up until now amazing you so it seems like you and i started on this contribution uh journey you know making a difference journey around about the same time this podcast has been uh, around for about five years as well um so this the, you just want to talk a little bit more around the pilot thing when did you become a qualified pilot how old were you then 
Um, well, uh, I think I started training. My Palo journey has gone longer than I expected uh-huh. uh, because of some challenges here and there. But uh, currently, I have a, a commercial pilot license, which allows me to fly commercial. But I'm currently training for my mount engine license, and that allows me to fly, you know, planes with multiple engines or more than one engine so to say so that is what i'm currently training for right now but i do have a commercial pilot license and uh, my journey for becoming a pilot uh, i think it said it maybe about three years back or four years mm. back because uh, i first went to school to do a uh, flight operations and management a diploma in flight operations and management but then when i was there uh, you know, as it is mandatory, we're going around school orient- orientation time. And uh, I see uh, a lady land a plane. And uh, when she got out, there was something so empowering about her mm. that I knew that I wanted to be that. No matter what I said, I have to be that because it was so inspiring. And when I got to interact with her, I realized, oh, well, she's no different from me. She has the same troubles as me. So... I decided to go for it. And uh, yeah, here we are. Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's a great, um, it's a great, well, firstly, I want to say that it's the stereotype of a pilot in Uganda is, is definitely not female. Am I right? In yeah, general, Africa boys. Africa in general. Yeah, in yeah. general. It's like it's yeah, it's yeah, too, yeah. it's it's Pete Retief. He's the pilot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And so yes, what 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 you've seemingly done, you know, in your pilot context, but more broadly within the context of your um your your foundation, right? The Bambino Life Foundation is that throughout this journey that you've been on, you've gone about deliberately breaking down stereotypes. And in the process, you've inspired people in the same way that, you know, that, uh, that African female pilot that initially inspired you. I think that was certainly the spark that now you've created this massive fire off. Um, and I wanted to kind of get more around into the stereotypes here. Um, in your view. Um, and I, you know, it's not often that I get to speak to people up in Africa um, it's usually people all around the world in that. So I'm quite interested to get my my um, my viewers and, and listeners to to get your perspective on this. Um, wh- how would you describe the stereotypes around women empowerment in in Uganda and more broadly in Africa? Um, if we are to be, uh, I mean, in Africa, women have been raised to be uh, mothers and caretakers to stay at home you know be the good wife uh, do this and do this so um it's it's been a journey to empowerment if you get what i mean it's not something that just came all of a sudden and you know women are empowered it's it's been a long long journey from women not being in the kitchen where they're supposed to be or not being you know uh cooking or houseways or stuff and, uh, you know, following their careers. And I'm not saying someone cannot have both because it is definitely, you can definitely have both. But I think uh, we are getting there to, I mean, if the few women who have been able to make it and they're in these empowered positions are able to use their positions to be able to inspire some people and also do or make a difference, I think most people are getting the idea that, you know what, it's not so bad to have women in such roles after all. Mm. Yeah. How does Mm. one go about breaking those stereotypes? Because I find that um, it's quite... It's not impossible. I think certainly a lot of stereotypes have been challenged and broken down, hence Me Too and, uh, you know, the Me Too movement and many, many others. Um, You know, in the African space specifically, what would you say are the biggest barriers to breaking down stereotypes? Is it a lack of sort of societal pressure or is it a lack of, you know, social media influence? Or where does the rubber really hit the road when it comes to breaking down the stereotypes that really do affect, you know, uh, women in general? In Africa, I think it would be the society, how the society expects you to behave more than social media, because social media is actually, if anything, it's helping. It's really helping because then you get to spread your work, you get to, you know, show the women who are doing amazing things in different fields. 
but the society expecting you to behave a certain way. I mean, if I'm to give an example, as a lady pilot, I wouldn't say that it's been an easy journey because you have uh, guys who do not think that you are smarter like them, sorry, smarter at the same level with them. And most of them think maybe you are getting favors being a lady. So they think that, you know, maybe someone is going easy on you and maybe you're sleeping with your bosses, maybe da, da, da. Like every single time a woman does something, it's like whatever she does has to be explained away rather than maybe she is smart or maybe she can do this and this. So I would say it's mostly society how they've been seeing women for such a long time and how they were raised. And it's going to take some time because if they, with the new generation, I feel like most people know what is happening, that there are different professions and women can take on different roles. But the older generation is just now getting out, you know, how they say uh, their, their, their time is getting done mostly in office position, but it was mostly the older generation that didn't think women, you know, were capable in being in such positions or this and this and this. So I think it would go back to society and how, you know, the society mindset, how people were raised. And yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And, but w let's get into the society piece then, because I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it's in many respects, it's a duty, a responsibility and an obligation for us to break down these stereotypes to foster um, gender equality. And, um, and so, and so society, quote unquote, is, is a very like, well, what is that, what exactly do we mean? And, and who exactly within the society uh, is part of that narrative? And, um, and then, you know, and then who is meant to do what exactly and you understand so so it's like if you it's like um i was once told well, by someone you know if you want power take it if you want equality take it um and there's there's arguments to say yeah no that makes sense simplistically but then in the real world practically especially if you're a woman in africa and uganda as an example it's not exactly easy just to take power do you know what i'm saying it's not exact it's not like a, a set of car keys that you can just pick up and then walk out with you know um <laughs> so so i wanted to kind of get your views you know, how do we, in the society, the role of society, if you think about men and women and, um, you know, the women who want equality, the men who, are, who potentially are reluctant to give it, how would you describe the, the roles of men and women? And how, does, how, how would you, you know, if you were to um, have the influence that you needed, how would you tackle something like that? How would you, you know, describe the roles necessary in order to break down the, the, the stereotypes that we're talking about? Um, okay, so um, for me, uh, what I think, uh, before the maybe equality and everything and feminism and all that, also I'm not a feminist, let yeah. me put that out there. But yeah, so, but what I want to, what I hope for is I just want women to be given the same opportunities as men, you know? I don't want them to be judged because of their gender. Because if someone gets the work done, then I feel like gender shouldn't limit them. If it's, let me say, a pilot job, you've given us a plane to fly from A to Z and I fly it from A to Z the way it is supposed to, then I feel like my gender shouldn't play a role in you determining whether I get the job or not. And if I'm doing the same exact job as my male counterpart, then I believe I shouldn't get less pay. I should mm. get the same pay as mm -hmm. that particular person. Not necessarily because all oh, this and this, women are stronger, no, all men are this. No, because we are doing the same exact thing. And we are all doing it the way it is supposed to be done. So I don't see the reason why one would get more and the other should get less. So for me, even through maybe my foundation, what I normally tell girls is if the opportunities are presented to you, we just want those opportunities. We just want those opportunities presented unto us. If you're to look at Uganda currently, there are more women than men. Really? So, yeah, women are more than men. So what does this mean? It means that you're going to reach a time whereby when you put out a job notice, you're going to get more women applying than men. And you, as an employer, are you going to not hire women because they're women and start looking for men? Or are you going to open your mind and start looking at what someone brings to the table rather than their gender? Mm. Yeah, it's a great so point. You want that kind of, yeah, so you want that kind of, opportunity presented it's not so much more oh we're going to fight we're going to kill people and this no it's just 
present them the same opportunities as you presented the men and let whoever is best at it do that job. Right. For me, that is what I think, yes. Yeah, well, we, do, we are seeing that wage gap come closer and closer together, um, most certainly. I think um, what I kind of wanted to get to uh, from here is kind of, you know, the work that you're doing with, uh, in terms of your foundation, you know, uh, mm. especially with children, promoting education, and I want to get into that piece, but, mm. but really about creating awareness around, you know, children living with disabilities and providing a sustainable environment mm. to, to children who don't have parents, who don't have the support system and this kind of stuff. And so on the education piece, do you feel that um, women, I mean, what is the role of the skills gap in your view in terms of closing that, you know, the uh, the wage gap, if that makes sense? In other words, if, do women in Uganda have the equivalent kind of education as, say, their male counterparts? And if they do, um, what would you say is, is something that, you know, the private sector could be doing in order to, to do what you're saying here, which is can you give us the opportunities on an equal basis? Yeah, um, I think actually not not thinking. I know women have uh, better qualifications or if not the same as men. And for me, um, and I'm going to really stick to this point, what I go back to even if I'm talking to the private sector is it's not more of uh, you have a place and, you know, you have these opportunities and, you know, people are coming and you're just selecting women because you're selecting them for the sake of selecting them to show that you are really doing something. It's more of give people, you know, the opportunities, let whoever apply, apply, and let those who are good at the job take it. Do not look at gender because I know that most people will look at gender when it comes to it all. You feel because those think, you know, as a lady, you know, she's going to reach a time, she's going to set a family, she's going to be pregnant, she'll go, get leave, she'll get this and this. And most people will not employ a woman generally, even if she's smarter, because they're looking at that period where she may be get pregnant. And if you are, uh, if you have children, or even if you don't have children, some companies won't take you on because now they're looking at that period of, you're going to reach a time and have children and you're going to be off. What I'm looking at for me is more of put out the qualifications that are needed. Put out the opportunities. Open the opportunity to both male and female. Let whoever's qualifications surpass that or what you need, let them get that particular opportunity. Because that is what is happening. You would find even if a woman you know, uh, got the job, she may not initially get it. They will not call her because of what I've just mentioned. They're going to look at her as, oh, she's going to be weak. She's going to be this. She's going to be doing this and this. Emotional, this, she'll get away. She'll start a family. And yet a man is going to stay there. Even if the wife is pregnant, the man is going to work. But you see, that is a bit unfair because this is nature. Someone is going to have children someone is going to want a family and also the man you know has that particular job so what i'm thinking is why don't they all have equal opportunities Mm. presenting that to them without looking at gender and necessarily saying you know the job is here if you can get it done well and good and give the salary that is worth of that job not because of the gender again Mm. and i think this is where most problems are coming from and most women are having a difficulty with it because if we're doing the same job, why do you have more money than me? Mm. Why are you being paid a, a higher salary than me? I think that is unfair because we all went to school. We both, you know, stayed up all night reading our books and we both, you know, quali- got the qualifications. So why are you getting more money than I am? I think that's a bit unfair. Mm. And uh, in Uganda, I want to say that it's not that as bad it's weird, but it's not that as bad. And uh, we have uh, women in so many, um, you know, big positions or powerful positions, heading companies and heading this and this. And day by day, women are empowering more women. So it's not that bad for a third world country, honestly. But at the same time, I feel like it should be better than it is right now. Mm. But again, I, I understand because we still have the mindset of women can't do much, you know, women are, some people find it even hard taking orders from women, (laughs) honestly, because they were raised to think that women should just, you know, be the ones taking, you know, Mm. the orders. So it's a mindset that has to be changed over time. Well, it's also an expectation that needs to change, right? Because um, this morning I shared a a clip on my LinkedIn page. It's basically 
there was a there was a, a video that went viral several months ago. It was basically a man being interviewed live on BBC. Maybe you saw this, and uh, his kids walk into the room in the background. And, um, mm. you know, and he's like, hush, hush. And he's live on air. It's like, it's a live, you know, global broadcast. And he's like, hush, hush. And then the, yeah, and then the, and yeah, then the helper it. comes I've in and it. she's like crawling on the floor and she's trying to pull the kid out. And then the next kid arrives and it's like complete pandemonium. Um, and the guy's like, apologies, 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 you know. I don't know if you saw yeah. that. It's slang funny. Um, and that I saw, yeah, I saw it. You saw it. And that, I saw it. That video went viral. And then uh, this morning I came across uh, uh, the same thing, okay, but only this time it was recreated. And what they did was they had a woman there being interviewed. It wasn't a man. But then the kids yeah. came in the background. But then instead of hush-hush, like go get out the room, get out the room, she picks up the kid, puts her – puts the child on her lap, takes a bottle out and puts the bottle in a kid's mouth and then puts the kid down and then takes out a perfectly cooked roast chicken. And then, uh, you know what I mean? It was like, and it went on and on and on and, and she never broke composure, but it was, it was a parody on the original clip that went viral. But what it was doing yeah. was raising the very clear expectations that if a woman is to be in a position of power and influence and therefore, you know, as, you know, as, as you describe a person who has the equal opportunity, even if she gets the opportunity, the expectation of society is that she must still be a perfect mom, cook the perfect meal, yeah. and do all yeah. the things that only a mom, I say only a mom, quote unquote, can do in the face yeah, yeah. of also now having to do you know, the role of becoming a, a business leader or a thought leader or whatever. And so... It's almost impossible to do both. Like my wife continuously is in, in a world of pain, right? In the sense that she's trying to ma to manage her career and manage the home life and, 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 and. And it's incredibly difficult to do both. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah. as you say, it's like, you know, if a woman is the CEO of a company and she gets pregnant, then she's going to go on nine months of maternity leave or six months of maternity leave or whatever it is, three months. And because she's now... On maternity leave, like I've had friends of mine, right, who are bit like at a big banks, the head of, you know, business banking and uh, went on maternity leave and had to come back early because the expectation was that she wasn't fit to fulfill her role, but she was fulfilling the role of being a mom. And that was a big one for me, you know, and so I wanted to kind of get into, do you feel that... So, uh, well, firstly, let me go back a step. How should we adjust the expectations of society to reflect the the, the birth rights of women, but then also to maintain the opportunities, as you describe, that we want for women all around the world? Um, you know, you know what I think. I feel like um, even when women are given the opportunity, the expectation is that they want a woman to act like a man. You get it. Mm. So it's 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 a bit unfair because the expectation is that when she gets a job, she should behave exactly like how the man is behaving, which is which is not possible because she's a mother. She has other things to do besides that. But it's actually quite funny that you ask that. The more I think about it, because it is a bit unfair and a bit unreal when you have if you're even to go in the context of the video that you just told me you know one person is having this interview the kids are coming in and the nanny is in the back you saw her she was so she was so guilty she felt so bad yeah. and she was pulling the kids back and then you're telling me that there is another video and this woman you know got the child because that is what she has to do she can't just send the child back you know, she has to make sure the child, because if the child is quiet, then the meeting is going to go on without any problem. And I'm just thinking if the husband was on the other side of the door having the same exact meeting, the children would be pulled away from the husband and instead brought to the side where the woman is. Because even if she's in this particular position, at the same time, she's expected to be a mother, mm. you know? Yeah. It's not going to take away from it that she's, you know, doing this exact position. She has to be a mother and she has to fulfill her duties both at home and at work. Yeah. And yet at work, the expectations are so high and they're comparing her with someone who does not have all these responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you, but the other thing I've noticed as well with this coronavirus, eh, we, I I, I'm literally on video 
video calls in Microsoft Teams the entire day, the entire day. And uh, I talk to probably, I would say, 40 or 50 different clients a day. And, um, and so everybody's working at home. And one of the things, like even today, like my kids just walk in and my, my five-year-old's hitting me with a cucumber and I'm having a very serious conversation with, uh, with a client, you know, in India. And, um, and, uh, and, and so the story goes. And what I've noticed is that when kids are uh, around the, the, the client or the person I'm talking to on the call, they always apologize it's like, oh, I'm sorry, my kids are around. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, but it's, why yes. would you would you apologize in any other context? Do you know what I mean? Like, I would never apologize yeah. for my kids being around. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I just wouldn't. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. my kids are around. They're my kids. I can't yeah. change yes, that. Yes. And I'm at home. Yes. So the, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, why should I apologize for that? And and and. And I didn't. I didn't apologize. I was like, "Oh, my kid's hitting me, haha!" You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Uh, but but it's to your yes. point though. It's because the expectation is that when I'm in a business environment, yes. you know what I'm saying. Like you must behave yes. a certain way. The it yes, must be a yes. clear background. You know, you must be wearing. Yes. Like, you understand. So and so and and it's an interesting clash of expe- of dynamics that we're finding ourselves in today right because we have to work yes, from home yes Do you know what i mean because the expectation is so ridiculous it's and insane. personally i think the way forward is to let women be women and i know this is going to come up a bit weird but the thing is that i believe uh what makes us unique is our differences what a woman can bring to the table, a man may not be able to bring to the table. And it's our differences that complement each other, you know, to make a workplace better because a woman will bring the nurturing bit of it. You know, she may not be just hot headed. She may just, you may try to look at it on the side of understanding and all this. And the man on the other hand may be like, no, you know, maybe put ego beyond anything and be like, no, this and this and this and this. So I believe uh, instead of, you know, having expectations that are so high, I feel like you should always remember that, you know, at the end of the day, she's a woman. She's a nurturer. She's a mother. And he's a guy. You know, he has his responsibilities, well and good, but they're different in a way. So when you're bringing these expectations when it comes to work, I feel like that should always be considered. And I feel I always go back to, because you find, I've seen so many women who have families, you know, they're running successful businesses, but at the same time, they're running successful families and they're balancing both. And I think it's not that easy. And I feel like that deserves an award because honestly, Mm -hmm. it is too much work. You have a family at home, you have people you have to head in the office, but you have to do all these things together. And don't forget, people expect so much from you. They want you to be this perfect human being, which is impossible. Mm. Well, the other thing I also say is that also applies to men. I'd say that Mm. the expectation is that, you know, I'm not in all cases, but in a large majority of cases, cases rather, Mm. the man must Mm. uh, be the entrepreneur, right? He must build a successful business and he must break his balls to build an empire or to provide for his family. But then he must be home at five o'clock. No exceptions. Do you understand? No, but it's, but it's, it's, like, it's impossible. You cannot always have idealistic expectations yeah. equally of the man. Like I, I understand what you're saying and I get what you're saying. It's warped, but also it goes the other way around. It's like no, saying, I, I do. I do agree know, with you. I do agree with like, you because I have seen families where a man, you know, is actually working like five jobs yeah. and he's killing himself out there to be able to provide. And maybe the woman is not doing anything. I think at the end of the day, it's about <laughs> communication from both people and understanding from both people when it comes down to it. Yeah. Well, the other thing to say is maybe this is a good point of departure here to talk about the work that you actually do with girls in your foundation. Um, let's talk about communication. I mean, how are you encouraging um, them to communicate? Do you know what I mean? What kind of ID, uh, like going back to the expectation things, some, some are great to aspire to, but some may just be impractical. Do you know what I mean? Like in certain mm. in certain. Um, let's just say, uh, careers, certain careers Mm. like in construction are just better suited for men because we're physically stronger, Mm. right? But in in others, 
are just better suited for women, right? Um, so like motherhood yes. is, an, is a great career, right? Um, but I'm not saying that that's the only one. I'm just saying, you know, at home. But in, uh, I yeah. wanted to kind of get to the to, to how should we engage with the, the youth of today? Do you know what I mean? Like in the context of equality, getting the right opportunities, you know, dealing with societal expectations, the expectation of the community, because, you know, in Africa, as you know, more than me, it takes a, yeah. a village to raise a child today. Um, a, gr- yeah. a great child and so it's about giving them a worldview that makes sense that's that's great yes. in terms of uh, a worldview that's great to aspire to because in Africa there's this this idea of the youth dividend where you know f- over half of Africa's entire population is aged between like 20 and 30 or 35 or something like that yeah. it's, it's insane yes. um, and so and so I wanted to kind of get your view, you know, given your experience there on the ground, talking to these girls and, and looking to inspire them, et cetera. How do we, what's your advice? What have you learned about engaging with uh, the youth and inspiring them and giving them a worldview that is practical and that makes sense for them? Um, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the places where we go, I feel like this should be out there, is that uh, Bambino, what we try to do is we go to rural areas so we are not mainly in the city and that because I believe most of the girls in city areas have more opportunities than girls in rural areas. And something that I've learned uh, on all uh, my outreaches uh, for the time being that we have been doing them is that most of the girls in rural areas don't dream big and it's really sad. But you see, the thing is that if you look at your community or if you look at yourself and your background, most of the times our background determines our dreams because if you're coming from a home where you may not have had lunch or even supper, you're not going to dream to be a pilot. It doesn't make sense. You can't even buy your own food. How will you become a pilot? So most of them are resigned into just getting married. If you're lucky, you know, just drop out of school, get some guy who has some little money. That is not even a lot. Maybe he pays some bright price. You get something there. You start a family. You have someone to feed you. And those even who dream, who try to dream, it's not that much. You don't see that hope, you know. It's not there. It's really sad because it goes to show that with your background, you look at, you know, where the world is going and you're like, I don't think you dream according to your capacity, if I can put it that way. You look at your parents, you look at your background and you feel like, I can't do so much. And this is what we, this is what I've noticed because... When we do talk to these girls, most of the times before I do start the training and everything is most of them want to do uh, maybe become a hairdresser, someone, most of them, if you're, it's it's actually surprising, but most of them want to become housewives and um, others just want to maybe sell this and this, a few things, but it's never much. And it's always the you very few like out of 100 who said that i want to become like a doctor or i want to become a lawyer and it's sad because you see the thing is that sometimes i feel like our background should never determine our future because you never know what could happen from now and you know two years in the future something could change there and if your dream wasn't big enough you may not have caught that dream anyway. Mm. So what you try to tell them or what I normally try to tell them is that I always use myself as an example. I never knew that I would become a pilot. I actually wanted to become an interior designer or maybe a chef at one point. That is what I thought. Uh, and that is because I knew we couldn't afford, you know, piloting. Mm. The tuition would never afford it. So I never dreamed that far. I, it was impossible for me. Mm. And uh, I use that, you know, I stand in front of them and I tell them because before anything, what I try to do through the foundation, me with my volunteers, is we try to make sure they stay in school. You know, you can't go to someone who has not had something to eat or something to, you know, to who doesn't have anything to wear. And you're telling them, you know, you can become anything. You have to first cater for those necessities that they do not have. And one of the things is that we teach them hand skills, different hands-on skills that can be able to, you know, become uh, commercial to them. They can be able to get some little money out of it if they do decide to do it. Mm. And the things that we teach them are able to make them stay in school because you can't dream that far if you're not in school, first of all. So we try to make sure that they stay in school first. That is our first priority. First, stay in school. 
Okay. Then when you're in school, then you have more opportunities as you know you go ahead. And the best way is to have simple skills with you that could teach you, you know, that you could use for commercial purposes. It's a bit of uh, sustainability. It's a sustainability kind of goal. And um, one thing you asked about the advice, one thing that I always tell them or that I've always uh, communicated with them is that I believe you can be anything you want to be in this world. Them as girls, I tell them, I believe you can be anything that you want to be, but it's going to have to start with you. No one else is going to make your dream come true but yourself. Mm. If you do not believe in yourself, no one else is going to believe in you because no one benefits from believing in you. Mm. So it has to start with you. You have to start with the dream yourself. Look at your surrounding. That's do you want to follow in the footsteps of everyone who's here, who has not gone far, or do you want to be that special someone? Do you want to make a difference? Mm. Do you want to step out of that rat race and you know, go out and spread your wings and become someone special, someone important, someone who can inspire the rest? Mm. I pose them these simple questions and I tell them to ponder down them. And most of all, I always tell them, never forget where you come from. For me, that is something that I always preach wherever I go because if you forget where you're coming from, the future is never clear and the path is never going to be clear once you forget. But if you remember where you come from, it is going to push you so much because you do not want to be where you are. You want to be a step higher. And so it's going to push you through your dreams, through everything that you want. Mm. And so that those are some of the things that I try to, you know. <laughs> so I wanted to... Um kind of echo what you say here because you know I've, i watched a series recently on um on netflix called self-made have you watched it um no i've recommended it but i'm not yet watching it so it's about um cj madam cj walker she basically it was she was the first millionaire in america but female millionaire and she was African. Um, and she was black. Yeah, and she was yeah, black, yeah, yeah African-American. And um, it was basically an, a fascinating story, which totally would sums up beautifully with the point that you made around self-belief and uh, self-actualization. Yeah. You know, she was um, on the bones of her ass in an abusive marriage. And uh, she, or she, was a, she was a cleaner. She basically cleaned clothes. And um, the day that her husband left her, she, uh, someone knocked on her door and it was a door to do salesman and it's a lady called Abby and she basically, you know, saw she was crying or whatever and so she took her under her wing and noticed her hair and her hair was shocking, you know, it was like patchy and all this kind of stuff and so she had this product that made hair grow and that's kind of how the, the story starts um, and then it evolves where, you know, she, she didn't, she knew that she had to make a change in her life. She knew that she had to believe in something bigger than the role that was given to her in life and the struggle that was given to her in life. And when she believed and she started to believe, she started to self-actualize. She started to take the necessary steps. And, and long story short, she went and built this massive company, this huge, huge, huge company. Mm. Um, and she was mm. living in the end next door to the, to, um, the Rockefellers. I mean, mm. you know what I mean? Like, it's just co a completely insane story. But it echoes yeah, this, yeah. I this idea that, you know, if regardless of um, who you are, you have to start with a dream. You have to start with a goal, yes. a simple goal, uh, ideally yes. a big one. <laughs> ideally a big yeah. one. And she was, by the way, like yeah. one, of, one of the things that they did really, really well in the script was they made it very clear how single-minded she was about attaining this yes. goal. She was like, at yes, all costs, exactly. I will not I will yes. not fail. I will do this thing. And she got tested. And also, by the way, she was, I mean, at that time, it was like, if you were black, you were like marginalized, right? So it wasn't like at what we have today where, you know, it's, it's yes. a lot better. Yes. It's a lot better, right? We got hip hop now. <laughs> you know, like back then it was like, you know, it was just like you, were, it was, it was the, it was the idea of still breaking the chains of slavery. It yeah, was still it like, was so hard to break through. Hectic, it was so hard to break like through, yes. way harder mm -hmm. than it is now. And, and yet she did exactly. it back then. Yeah. And she left a legacy yeah. and she also started a foundation and, um, you know, and, 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 and. So I highly recommend checking out. It's called Self Made on Netflix. Um, but it does truly echo the sentiment here. And I just wanted to pick up on one thing um, that, uh, that you said. And you said that the biggest problem that you've seen is that, um, is that uh, you know, girls, especially in the rural areas 
of uh, of Uganda. They don't dream big. Is that because they're not exposed to successful pilots like uh, Ashar Bafarida and um, and many other, like Oprah Winfrey? You know, uh, like cert- surely they they have access to information that they've never had before. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, is that yes. your kid walking and, um, in? Is that your kid walking in? Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting <laughs> that you've asked that. <laughs> it's interesting that you've asked that because actually uh, that is what I talked about in my last TEDx talk. And uh, what I said was uh, we need to have, you know, African girls to have relatable role models. And I feel like they lack that. They do not see themselves in the role models presented to them. And I like the fact that you said Oprah. But if we were to be realistic, Oprah and someone in rural areas, I don't see them, I don't see that being relatable because she's all the way on the other side. You know, she grew up in, um, it might have been bad, but compared to Ugandan standards, it would have been okay. You understand? Mm. And uh, so you do not see them relating themselves to her in a way but if someone who has grown up in the same country as them probably gone to the same school as them even you if someone went to the same school as you and you know you saw them in your neighborhood and one day they came back and you know they were this they had made something out of themselves you would want to know how they made it and if they spoke you'd actually listen because you know they're once in a position that you are in it would make more sense to you than having an international role model because that is the first place everyone goes to. Everyone says opera, everyone says uh, Obama, Michelle Obama, everyone, you know, all these amazing ladies, it's great. They are incredible. But are they relatable role models to the girls in rural areas or in rural parts of Africa? Are they? They are not. Because in their childhood, they did not face problems of early marriages. No, they did not. Mm. Yet this is the problem that we have in most rural areas. So we do not have relatable role models. We do not have relatable role models in most African countries because even the women who make it from Africa, they go and make their name outside of Africa. They go on the international scene, but they never come back home. And that is where the problem is. If Mm. all these women who left Africa and became something of themselves came back home to inspire the girls you know, in their communities, in their societies, that would change the narrative extremely. You'd have girls dreaming way bigger because now they've been presented this opportunity, an opportunity to dream big because someone who went to the same school with them or who went in the same, who grew up in the same village made something out of themselves. Mm. You know, if that person comes back to you and says this and this and this, trust me, you're going to listen. Why? Because you see yourself in them. Mm. But um, that's where the problem is. But where, how do we activate more role models, though? I mean, should, like, if you were to describe what a good role model should be, I mean, is it obviously, you know, I would say that you're probably one of them. But I mean, more broadly, the, surely there are uh, relatable role models, quote unquote, like in Uganda. Like, there must be, right? And, and and how do we? Yes. How do we recruit and activate them? Um. Yes, we do have we do have uh, amazing, powerful women in Uganda, but um, maybe some of them have have gone to rural areas. I wouldn't know. I can't speak from that. But uh, for me, when I say that, I'm trying to use myself as an example because you know I could have just ended on saying, "Well, I'm a pilot," and it ended there. Mm-hmm. I could have just done that, you know, and left and, and live my life. No one, you know, is going to hold me at gunpoint and say, "Hey, why aren't you doing this and this?" But I thought that it, I should take a step father and you know inspire girls along the way to my on my path to the top that is what i thought i thought that we could you know work together be able to inspire these girls and not be someone just for myself but be able to have a purpose on this earth and that is to help other people you know through the journey so i feel like this is going to be more of a personal kind of uh, thing for most people, but on the other on the other side, I do have uh, an organization. Actually, it's not an organization; it's an initiative. It's called STEM Queens, and um, here what we do is we get uh, women who are in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in those you know unheard of professions that people don't even know that women do. And what we do is we get these ladies and we take them to different schools so that they can inspire young girls. Hmm. So that girls can listen from them, they can hear from them, and you know they can be able to learn from them. Hmm. So I think 
it's it's we are getting there but i feel like it should be more of try to have a purpose whatever if you have a voice i feel like you should be able to use it in whatever way possible to be able to inspire you know like how you're doing a podcast mm. not everyone is doing that not everyone is doing that again it goes to show that i think at the end of the day it's it's like a personal decision to want to make a difference mm. but then you can also try to push for example i'm hoping that if people do see maybe this video today they can be inspired also want to make a difference and know that you do not have to make a grand gesture and help like 20 people or 10 you can even start with 2 3 4 and those same people can always push it forward or can pay it forward sorry Yeah, it's um, it's a great point. I do a lot of talks at schools, and I can say, like, speaking in front of a room full of corporate fat cats does it doesn't even come close. It's um, mm-hmm. you know, the the hunger for someone to stand up and go, guys, it's okay not to know what you want to do, you know, exactly. um, and yes. um, and I didn't know, and I and I you know I didn't know for a long time, and I still made it, you know. um and uh, just to give them a, a kind of a sense that they that it's okay to be who they are whether they yes. um have a big goal or a small goal or they decide to be you know um you know play it small and to be a hairdresser that's yeah. okay too you know but whatever as long as they believe in themselves as, yeah. absolutely and as you said as long as they also have uh, uh, they're able to create a purpose that they can f- find fulfillment and ultimately some joy with you know um yes, and and yes. that's that that's really the secret right um and so society dictates to us why you know it's that being a hairdresser is not enough or that being a farmer is not enough or that being an artist is not enough that you have to, and this is mainly a western ideology right um that um that uh, you must play it if you're not successful if you don't win big you know um yes. and and actually it's a full zerant in many respects to subscribe to that philosophy because in in truth it actually comes down to the little things that matter you know it's the conversations that yes. you have in private that nobody knows about it's the conversations that i have here with uh, with my team that aren't recorded on the podcast that matter you know um and and things like that and so i find purpose in 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 many little things and ultimately they all they all add up to the attainment of something or whatever that is for you you got to figure that out um but um but also to trust in that there is a process behind these things you know and that if you if you put your failures out there that the universe will find a way to give you what you want and as you said it's about believing in what you want that you can do this thing and then you will take the appropriate action and so luck happens you know you get you get luck that you create yourself but then luck just that the universe and markets just bring back to you which is kind of where I'm going with my next point which is around this campaign so the um the campaign that you did for the United Nations uh, impossible to ignore campaign i mean that was a classic example right of what i'm talking about you know uh, there's you in Uganda you know and then suddenly you're on billboards all around the world walk us through that so oh. tell us a little bit more about that campaign uh, how did it come about and what was the impact that you had you know before i even tell you about the campaign i like that you mentioned uh, the universe i like that you say that and i think maybe for some people they will say god which is amazing and i think that uh, in this world or the world in general if you try to serve a purpose that is beyond yourself somehow things will always align for your betterment mm-hmm. i know it's impossible to to believe sorry <laughs> but most of the times if you're serving a purpose that is beyond yourself and always help others somehow things always align themselves the way that they're supposed to be without you even doing anything about it which is incredible Uh, and great uh, so about the impossible to ignore campaign um it was it was uh, on international women's day in i think last year yeah it was last year 2019 on international women's day and uh, what happened was i didn't know <laughs> you know because when i did receive an email it was from an agency uh, it's called haves i think in uk havas Havas, Havas, Havas Media, yeah. Yes, yes. So I received an email from them and they told me that I was going to future 
uh, in the impossible. They didn't say impossible to ignore campaign, but they said that I'm going to feature in the International Women's Day campaign for the UN women. And I didn't know how big it was going to be, honestly. I didn't know it was going to be big. So I say, oh, okay, great. And then they told me that they had selected six other women. Wait, um, could, yeah, I think six. Yeah, six. I always forget. Maybe eight. Um, no, there were six. We'll go with six. Should I look at my Okay, <laughs> sorry. I was going to look at my phone. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, they they say that they had selected other women and they say that it would be on International Women's Day. So what they asked me is that they would need a picture that, you know, shows a seriousness, no makeup, no anything, just raw, like, you know, like how you're supposed to be because they're trying to bring out that fierceness out of a woman or a lady or something like that. I said, great. So the next email I received after sending them the pictures was the places where I was going to appear. And I was like, whoa, I, I could not believe it. It was incredible. It was Times Square. It was the London, wait, the Rail Underground London, and then King Cross Bridge London, and then New York, so many places. And I, I was like, oh my God, I could not believe it. And when it actually came out, because I think covers worked with uh, Facebook, they worked with, um, is it called, is it, I always say it wrongly, it's Nazgat. NASDAQ, NAS- yeah, the NASDAQ, yeah. Yes, and then also GCX something, I have forgotten it. Okay, so they work with so many uh, advertising platforms, and it was more of these people uh, donated their space for free. It was supposed to be on International Women's Day, and they created over 2 million impressions. It was everywhere, everywhere. The pictures were just everywhere. My face was plastered everywhere i could not believe it new york times square i've never been to new york myself and you know uk and you know friends were sending me different pictures from across the world the westfield world trade center i could not believe it and when i saw the women that i featured with i was mind blown i was mind blown i mean mm. who Dr. were you Christian featured Johnson. with christian johnson yeah yeah she's the first african-american uh, deputy director at nasa one of the people who inspired, I think, the hidden figures. If you've watched that movie, ah, yes, yes, because yeah, yes, yes, and then also uh, B T Wolf. She's a uh, Wolf. I think I'm saying her name right. B T Wolf. She's a musician, and uh, she's based in Los Angeles, and she is incredible. She she created this jacket whereby if you have your phone and you're next to her, you know, you can just download all her music albums. How incredible is that? <laughs> and it, it, yeah, because she's innovative. So she was in, you know, innovation. And what they were trying, what they were saying is that we're selecting women innovators that had to be recognized because we're saying that for the longest time, the world has always recognized male innovators and never the women. And so this campaign was supposed to be in your face. You mm. turn around, getting a taxi, see a face there. Go to you know the rail, see it first there. Go everywhere. It was supposed to be first, 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 and it had impossible to ignore campaign. And it would it said Ashaba Farida, she is now impossible to ignore. So that you know, you know, they were putting these women in your face. Now you have to know them by force. They are innovators. So here they are. Feel it. <laughs> it was incredible. I can't believe it. I still can't believe I featured. It was so surreal for me. And every time I look at those pictures, I'm I'm just mind blown. I'm just mind blown. But this is what I'm talking about, right? That you put yourself out there. You, as you said, you were contributing. And when you contribute and yes. you decide to make a difference to a cause greater than yourself, stuff happens. Yes. You know, yes. The, the stars align and something fucking happens. Not all the time, but cer- yes. certainly yes. a large portion of the time, right? Because if you weren't doing what you were doing, you wouldn't have been regarded as a face uh, of a campaign that was entitled "Impossible to Ignore," right? You wouldn't have made the cut, that, right? So that is true. So and and so you know you lucked out there. Going back to um, the two types of luck, um, but um, but I think um, I want to kind of get into kind of some motivational stuff here, and then kind of wrap it up. Um, you know, um, what motivates you now? I mean, and I always ask this question to my guests, but why do you do what you do? Like, why do you do all of this? Um, honestly, um, for me, I think it's, it's God actually not, I think it is God because 
everything that has happened in my life up until now, I would be lying if I said that I've worked, uh, maybe I have like an agent who reaches out and says, hey, can you feature her here? Can you interview her here? Can you do this and this and this? No, it's not happened that way. And I feel like I've come from so far, from a place or from a position where I didn't think I would ever be anyone in this world. I only had but a dream and I knew that I wanted to be big and do something. That is all I knew. That is the dream that I had. I knew that I had a purpose and I knew that my purpose was to be able to help others. But I didn't know how to push through with it. All I had was a dream and just believing that God would make you know this dream come true. And seeing that dream unfold in different stages, you know, things aligning in a particular way that they're supposed to made me realize that I'm on the right path. Mm. And that even motivated me to do much more and not worry about, you know, I don't have this, I shouldn't do this. Because from the very beginning, when I started my foundation, I had zero, nothing. I was a student, you know, and yet I had a charity and I was using pocket money that my mother would give me to eat or to use at school to buy donations and take them to different orphanages. I had nothing, yet I was already doing this. That goes to show that I had the love from the very beginning to be able to help. And as I grew older and as I was able to get more you know, support and more encouragement from people, I knew that I was definitely on the right path. And for me, it gives me much joy to see that I can be able to help someone. Because if I think back, that place where I was, if someone came to me and said, let me help you, I think I would have been happy. I really would have. Mm. And I feel like if I can be that person for some people who do not have people to help them, then it gives me greater joy. And that is what drives me every single day. Because I knew I would have wanted that back then. If someone had come back then and said, you don't have this. Let me help you. Let me give you a hand. It would have been amazing. And I know it's the same that I'm trying to do. And God has made it so easy for me and I have no excuse not to be able to help others. Cool. So that's what drives me. Mm. Amazing. Well, Ashaba, thanks so much for uh, your time on the show today. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Um, but I just want to end by saying, you know, um, I, th- I think you really are an inspirational woman. And I think um, I'm incredibly excited to see what you do, uh, you know, um, in the next few years and beyond. Um, I think we need more people like you to make the difference that is needed, especially in Africa. Um, And yeah, I wish you all the best. Well, thank you so much. I'm so, (laughs) uh, I'm so happy. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story and it's, it's great pleasure to be here. And if I could say maybe one last word to anyone out there listening, if I'm allowed is, uh, (laughs) is, um, I don't think oh, oh, never let you know the circumstances that surround you stop you from believing in yourself. And uh, I know it sounds cliche because most people use this word a lot and they say, believe in yourself, believe in yourself. But really, believing in yourself will push you so much far than anything else will because it already starts with you. It starts with you and with you that you can make a difference in this world. And also living beyond yourself. I mean, with even the current situation happening right now, I know there's some people who are just sitting there like, eh, I won't do a thing. But I feel like the way forward for humanity is to be able to think beyond ourselves. And that is why we are in situations that we always find ourselves in because we are incapable of thinking beyond ourselves. We're only thinking about ourselves, me, 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 me. Mm. But if we learn to think beyond ourselves and see the difference that we can make, and not blame everything on other people, and we start taking responsibility for some of our actions, I think that goes a long way. So the last message, believe in yourself. And for any young girl out there, you can be anything that you want to be. As long as you are happy, believe in yourself and never let anyone around you tell you any different. Because it's always going to be a lot of opposition from so many people who don't believe in you. But at the end of the day, when you're in your room and you're thinking, it is you and you alone. So believe in yourself and never let that anyone take that away from you. Preach, sister. Preach, damn it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. Amen to that. Amen, amen, amen. amen. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ashava. Awesome. Okay.